very important. And how those cranial nerve will come out from the cranium and their extracranial course, course branches. And apart from this one, you have to know the olfactory pathway, test pathway, and some of the applied aspect of uh, some important cranial nerve. So these are the overall content of the cranial nerve is the type of those cranial nerve. So either those are the sensory, motor, or the mixed one. So those you can memorize. Uh, there is a particular mnemonics for this one. Uh, some say marry money, but my brother say bad boy marry money. So this one is a mnemonic. So S for sensory, another S for sensory, M for motor, and B for when you go both, both sensory and motor. So in this way you can remember. You busy us. You thasa. You know this one, eh? So are are you hearing the are you hearing the mnemonics for the first time, or you have already heard about this? Okay, so okay, then I'll skip this one. Eh? Now, next one is each cranial nerve has got the two origin. One is known as a nuclear origin. Nuclear origin means it is mainly present within the brain, and that may be a motor nucleus or maybe a sensory nucleus. Next one is a superficial origin. Now, how this cranial nerve will come out from the brain? So uh, in the when you are reading the brain stream on the surface of the brain stream, I think you have seen the various cranial nerve there that are attached to the brain stream. So that is known as the superficial origin. Now you can see over here, see this one, the first and the second cranial nerve. This one is the okay. so this one is the first first and the second cranial nerve. Second cranial nerve, uh, first cranial nerve, olfactory. Next one is this optic. So this cranial nerve are mainly attached to the uh, forebrain. Next one, next one is the third cranial nerve. So can you see the third cranial nerve? This is the third cranial nerve and the fourth cranial nerve that is attached to the midbrain. Next, the fifth cranial nerve is arising from the ventral surface of the bones. Now next one is the sixth. Seven, eight are attached to the pontomedullary junction. So they will, they will arise from the pontomedullary junction. They will come out from the brain from the pontomedullary junction. Now the remaining, the remaining one, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. They all are attached to the medulla oblongata. So I, I this thing, this uh, attachment, the cranial nerve attached, the superficial origin you have already learned in the brain stream, in the midbrain, medulla, like midbrain bones, and the medulla oblongata. So these are the overall superficial attachment. When you see all the cranial nerve, all the cranial nerve will arise from the, or they will come out from the ventral surface of the brain stream. But can you press the trochlear nerve? This one, this one is the fourth cranial nerve that is known as a trochlea. The trochlear cranial nerve will arise from the dorsal surface of the brain stem. So this is only the nerve which will arise from the dorsal surface and that may come in your MCQ. Okay, which of the following cranial nerve will arise from the dorsal surface of the brain stem. Now next one is how the motor nuclei and the sensory nuclei, those are formed and how they are differentiated. So you can see over here, this is known as the new relation. The formation of the neural tube is known as the new relation. Now initially, when you see the neural tube, the neural tube will consist of the single layer of the tall columnar cell. Now, can you compare this diagram with the B1? You can see over here, this tall columnar neuroepithelial cell will get proliferated and form the pseudostate fat epithelium. Later on, this cell will again get proliferated and form the three distinct layer. Now, in this way, the three distinct layer of the neural tube is formed. Now, what are the name of those three layer? The inner is known as the epidermal layer. The outer is known as the mantle layer. And this one is known as the marginal layer. Is it clear this one? So this one is the epidermal mantle, and this is known as the marginal layer, marginal zone. Now see, this, one, this is the same diagram. This is known as the epidermal. This one is known as the mantle, and this is known as the marginal. Now what is happening over here? On the lateral side of the central canal, or on the inner aspect of the epidermal layer, you can see some group. This one is known as the sulcus limitans. Now this sulcus limitans will appear. And next thing what will happen over there is the mantle zone. This mantle zone will get 
multiply or it will get proliferated and form such a bulge anteriorly and posteriorly. This one is the bulge. This is known as the basal plate and this is known as the alar plate and this is known as the roof plate and this is known as the floor plate. Now this thing you will be reading this one in the development of development of CNS. I think development of CNS is over. Boys okay, no? Boys okay. This is not no? Okay. Now next is in the basal plate. What you have to know over here is main is mantle layer will get proliferated into the basal plate and alar plate. The basal plate will consist of the motor nuclei and the alar plate will consist of the sensory nuclei. This thing only you have to know. Now let us see another one. So this one is the floor of the fourth ventricle. Now over here, can you see this one is the sulcus limit and you see more, eh? your roof plate ne, our separate bogo. Eh? So this one is the sulcus, uh, sulcus limiting. This one is the basal plate which consists of the motor nuclei and this is the alar plate which consists of the sensory nuclei. Now how many nuclei are there in the motor area? So over here we have the three and over here we have the four nuclei. Now see, near the sulcus limit, in your sulcus limit in Konojikma, we have got the visceral part. So this is known as the general visceral efferent. Same thing. We also have the general visceral efferent because this is a sensory. Sensory unibitike ki boyo, efferent unibitike and motor unibitike efferent. Now away from the sulcus limit, we have got the special sense visceral. When you say, I'll repeat once again. Near to the sulcus limit end, mainly the visceral component is there. So uh, mainly, mainly you, just, uh, you can re uh, remember uh, this functional component in, in this way also. Just see, we have the two, either, uh, either the information is carried from the viscera or carried from the body. So in this way, we have got the visceral and next one is the somatic. Our somatic matter, just see the somatic. So uh, it may carry the general sensation, it may carry the special sensation. So on the basis of that, general somatic afferent, special somatic afferent is given. Now next one, see the visceral one. In the viscera, it may carry the pain temperature sensation from the viscera. So that is known as a general visceral afferent. Now next one is, it carry the special sensation from the viscera, that is known as the a special visceral afferent that means it may carry the special sense uh, special uh, senses and that may be a taste sensation or that may be a smell sensation so from the viscera so those are known as special visceral afferent now next when you have to see the motor part motor part makisa the visceral is divided into general and special but the somatic is not divided so we just say the somatic efferent then we say special visceral efferent general visceral effect so these are the all the functional component next step is see the sulcus limitant near the sulcus limitant the general visceral effect and general visceral part is present now away from the sulcus limitant a special visceral is present now away from that only the somatic is present that means the uh, the nerve which will carry uh, the information from the viscera will be present near to the sulcus limitant or the nuclei, those nuclei will be present near to the sulcus limited. Is it clear now? You so these are the functional component, and you have to remember all those. Now, next is the first one is the somatic efferent. Now, what the somatic efferent is going to do? The somatic efferent, and over here we do not have the general and the special one. So the somatic efferent means it is going to carry the information from the viscera or it will carry the information towards the viscera. Efferent pony, basically, boy. To ask the visitor. Okay, that means it is the somatic effect. You just you have to remember this one is very important. You have to remember. Eh? You yeah the girl. If you understand this one, then it will be very easy to find out the functional component of the cranial knob. You buzi na bani idam garon sir. Ab somatic effect maide. Somatic effect means those cranial knob will have the functional component as somatic effect if those cranial knob will innervate or those cranial knob will supply the muscle of the organ developed from the uh, 
ectoderm, surface ectoderm, or somatic origin. Just see this one. So it is it mainly supplied the muscle, skeletal muscle of the somatic origin. That means upper limb and lower limb are the skeletal muscle, but those are supplied by the spinal nerve. So we do not have to talk about the uh, functional component of those things. Eh? Mainly this functional component, mainly we are talking about the cranial nerve. And you see, we have to search those cranial nerve which is supplying the skeletal muscle of somatic origin. When you can run some face map, which area? Which part is having the skeletal muscle of the somatic origin? Kun mounts skeletal muscle. Muscle of mastication. Muscle of mastication is uh, the skeletal muscle bones. Oh, yeah. We know, you know, muscle of mastication is arise from the branchial arches. It's somatic origin on body is matter. Let's see. So that means the eye, the muscle of the eye. That means extraocular muscle of the eye. Oh, next one is the tongue. Tongue is also the skeletal muscle. Tongue is skeletal muscle. Body, body, because honey, no. Hello. Amen. Okay. So the tongue, the muscle of the tongue, and the muscle of the eye. Those are. The muscle is skeletal striated muscle of the somatic origin. That means you have to source the nerve which is supplying the muscle of the eye and which is supplying the muscle of the tongue. So you just see our somatic e frame the cranial nerve three, the cranial nerve four, the cranial nerve six. The three, four, six are supplying the muscle of eye, extracular muscle of the eye. Next one is the hypoglossal uh, nuclei. Hypoglossal nucleus of the hypoglossal nerve that is supplying the muscle of the tongue. So those will be having the somatic effect. Now, why I'm saying this one? About the pole, oculomotor Write down the functional component of oculomotor One thing you can write oculomotor the somatic effect. It is one of the functional components of somatic effect. Now, next, if you have to write the functional component of the hypoglossal nerve. Then you can write it is a somatic event. So for that purpose, you have to be very clear about this thing. Now next, I'll move to the special visceral event. That means it is also supplying the muscle or the event motor kalebonita. Motor means either it has to supply the muscle or it has to supply the gland. Over here, this uh, a functional component, this nuclei is supplying the muscle. Eh? Now, a special visceral efferent, those cranial nerve will have the functional component as a special visceral efferent. For that thing, the cranial nerve has to supply the muscle arising from the branchial arches. You see? To muscle derived from branchial arches. Now, out of six branchial arches, the first branchial arches is First, the muscle, can you name the muscle arising from the first branchial arches? First branchial arch, but only muscle Q. Muscles of mastication. So muscle of mastication and the trigeminal knob is going to supply for this one. Now next, we have the facial muscle, second branchial arch, facial muscle. The facial knob will innervate this, those one. Next, we have the third, uh, third branchial arch, which will, uh, from where the stylopharyngeus muscle will arise, that is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Next, we have the fourth pharyngeal arch. From there, the muscle of the larynx, pharynx will arise from both fifth, uh, fourth and fifth. Oh, sorry, fourth and sixth, because fifth is going to disappear. So from the fourth and sixth, uh, muscle of the larynx and the pharynx is going to arise, and those are innervated by the 10 and the 11 cranial nerve. So all those will be having the functional component as special visceral efferent. So we have the 5, 7, and 9, 10, 11 is combinedly known as the nucleus ambiguous, which may come in your MCQ, which of the following, the component or the nucleus ambiguous is formed by which of the following cranial nerve. The 9, 10, 11 is combinedly known as nucleus ambiguous. Now next one, I'll move to the another one that is known as the general visceral efferent. Now general visceral if this is going to supply, uh, this is going to uh, give, or th this this will give the preganglionic parasympathetic outflow. But you see, which cranial nerve will give the preganglionic parasympathetic outflow? Which which cranial nerve? Preganglionic parasympathetic outflow. 
Full play in zero. Three. Seven nineteen. Seven nineteen. So three. For the three, we have the special nucleus arranger with pale nucleus. Now seven, we have the uh, in uh, super salivated nucleus. Then for the glossopharyngeal, we have the inferior salivatory nucleus. Next, we have the dorsal nucleus of the vagus. Those will give the preganglionic parasympathetic outflow. So three, seven, nineteen will have with the functional component as genital, visceral, efferent. Now, motor part is finished. We'll move on to the sensory one. Just see the sensory one. We have the general visceral afferent, and next one is the special visceral afferent. Now, just focus on the general visceral afferent. Our general visceral afferent. When you this is going to, uh, this is carrying the general sensation from the viscera. It is carrying the general sensation from the uh, viscera. So, general sensation from the uh, viscera. This, this one is carrying the uh, general sensation from the viscera. Now, next we have the special visceral afferent, which is combinedly denoted by the nucleus of tractus solitarius. Hey, a nucleus of tractus solitarius. One go the seven nine ten is known as a nine ten misspoke. Right, so seven. Nine ten is commonly known as a nucleus of tractus solitarius. Now, don't get confused over here. I'm afraid you won't enjoy. GVA and SVA is combinedly represented by the nucleus of tractus solitarius. First, I'll explain the special one. Eh? So, SVA maki gorsa bani. It is going to carry the special sensation from the viscera. So, special sensation from the viscera, but it carry gorni bani. One mati tongue. Oh, so it is going to carry the test sensation from the tongue. Now, can you uh, recall those nerve which is carrying the test sensation from the tongue? Kiki two seven facial, then glossopharyngeal, glossopharyngeal and vagus yeah, seven nineteen. Those that is known as the nucleus of tractus solitarius. So over here, can you see the upper part? This part will be having a component as S V A, and the lower part of the nucleus of tractus solitarius will receive the general sensation. But see, nucleus of tractus solitarius ko mati ko partly special sensation receive karsa, tolo ko partly general sensation receive karne baku baira. We combinedly called this one. We combinedly put a nucleus of tractus solitarius in both G V A and S V A. Is it clear? Hello. Clear. Hello. Did you? Did you, ma'am? Okay. Now I'll move on to the green part. Eh. So this one is known as a general somatic afferent. Now what is it is going to do? It is going to carry the uh, pain, temperature, sensation from the body. That means mainly from the face area. No, a face area, but a main temperature sensation or carry on it. What is one cranial nerve? There is only one. Trisimnal. Trisimnal. So we have the sensory nuclei of the trisimnal. That may be a mesencephalic nuclei. That may be a spinal. That may be a principal nuclei. So all those will be having a general. Uh, those will be having a general somatic afferent. Now move to the special somatic afferent. Now the special somatic afferent means that it's carrying a special sensation from particular viscera. When you say special sensation, capital uh, around them. So what are the special sense organ? We have the vision, we have the olfactory, we have the taste sensation, and next one is uh, hearing. Oh, so out of all those, the tongue, the tongue over here, the taste sensation, the taste sensation belong to this part. Nucleus of tractus solitarius. So, uh, whenever you will be reading, uh, uh, whenever you will be reading the uh, this one, the test sensation. Oh, so those will be having the functional component as S V. Now, next one, next one is the smell. The smell, the nose, uh, that means the olfactory, the olfactory cranial nerve. Will be related to the uh, special visceral afferent because it has the close relation with the uh, taste. That's why we keep this one in this part. Now our remaining key boy, hearing the vestibular cochlea, and next one is the optic. So the vision and the vestibular cochlea will be having the special somatic afferent. You buzio? Is it clear this one? Or repeat what the number so you? 
So special senses in ma we have with the optic nerve. Oh, optic nerve. Next one is the vestibular cochlea, which is uh, mainly uh, related to with the hearing. And next one we have with the test sensation. Test sensation is carried by the seven, nine, and ten. Next one is the olfactory smell. Why you cranial? It is the buzzing, you know. Now, when you have to talk about the first cranial of olfactory, the olfactory smell is related with the test senses, and it is main. It is closely related with the uh, test part. That's why about the the smell and the test. Those cranial nerve which is related with the smell and the test will be having as a special visceral afferent. So when you have to uh, say the functional component of the olfactory, you cannot say this one is the special somatic afferent, but you have to say it is a special visceral afferent because the smell is related with the test. Our test could the boy allow the 719 nucleus of tactus solitarius is special visceral afferent. But next one. Our optic is the second cranial knob. The optic second cranial knob is carrying uh, is mainly related with the Reason. So this one is having a functional component as a special somatic afferent. Next one, the vestibular cochlea, that is the hearing. It is also carrying the special sensation. So this is a special somatic afferent. Buzi over you. Hello. Buzi, ma'am. You actually, oh, you only time lags. Sorry, this one is a difficult part of, part of the cranial knob, so it will take time to. Remember all those things. Now this one is a this one is a kind of note for you. This is the same thing. This is the same one. Now this is also the same one. I just mentioned those one in the box. Now, so this over here in this row also, this one, the red one will represent the motor nuclei and the blue one will represent the sensory nuclei. Now the first will move to the olfactory knob. So the olfactory knob is what type of knob? It is a sensory, motor, or the mixed? Olfactory. Sensory. It is a sensory. So sensory will be the component will be E or A. E friend will be the friend will Afferent. Afferent. Now, out of all those four afferent, the functional component of olfactory knob will be? Key on a such the function of it. It is carrying the special special senses on a when you see special senses on from body. When you see special visual ones are you? You you sorry sorry you olfactory eh? okay this one optic one so this one is the olfactory this is the smell which is related with the test senses on so this is known as a special visceral afferent. Now see over here the olfactory knob is covered by the uh, meningeal sheath. Now how the olfactory knob will arise, you can see in this figure, this one is the bipolar olfactory knob. So the axon of the bi uh, bipolar olfactory neuron, uh, which is present in the uh, nasal mucosa that will form the olfactory knob. You can see in this part also, you can see the bipolar olfactory cell. This is the axon. This one is the uh, peripheral process. This one is the central process. The central process will the central process will form the olfactory knob, and this olfactory knob will pass through the cruciform plate. You have uh, your bone part, the cranial, the basalis polycircular. You know? So in the basalis, I think you have seen the cruciform plate from where the olfactory knob will enter into the brain. Then finally, it will enter into the olfactory bulb. This this is known as the olfactory bulb. Now, what is happening over there? The olfactory nerve is synapsing with the cell present in the olfactory bulb. And in the olfactory bulb, we have mainly three different types of cell. One is known as the mitral, granular, and the tuft cell. These are the different types of cells which are present in the olfactory bulb. The axon over here, this will synapse uh, in the mitral cell with the mitral cell. And from here, the axon of the mitral cell and the axon of the tuft cell will form the olfactory tract. So what you have to remember is you have to remember the olfactory knob. The olfactory knob will form the olfactory bulb. Then from the olfactory bulb, we have the olfactory tract. So after the formation of the olfactory tract, you can see 
This one, this one is olfactory pathway. We have the olfactory nerve, olfactory bulb, olfactory tract. Then olfactory tract is further divided into three different parts, medial olfactory stria, intermediate olfactory stria, and the lateral olfactory stria. I'll show you this one in this figure. Okay, figure Now just see. Olfactory nerve, olfactory bulb, olfactory tract. Now this one is the medial olfactory stria. This one is the intermediate, and this one is the lateral olfactory stria. Now, the medial olfactory stria will terminate, final terminate in this gyrus. This is known as the paraterminal gyrus, which is present in front of the lamina terminalis. Okay. So, this will terminate in the paraterminal gyrus. Now, next one is over here. This is the intermediate olfactory stria, which will terminate into the olfactory tubercle in the anterior porphyritary substance over here. Now next, this is known as the lateral olfactory stria, which will terminate into the primary uh, pyriform cortex. Now the pyriform cortex has the connection with other uh, other part also. This will be having a connection with the um, amygdaloid body, entorhinal cortex, hippocampus. So these are known as this one. This one is known as the primary olfactory cortex. And this one is known as a secondary olfactory cortex. So altogether, this will overlap. Finally, you can say this will terminate into the pyriform cortex. So this is the olfactory pathway. You can see this diagram, this uh, um, chart. So olfactory nerve, bulb, olfactory tract for the divided into three one, medial, paraterminal gyrus, intermediate, anterior porphyry substance, lateral pyriform cortex. So th this one is the olfactory pathway. Is it clear? Hello? Clear, Sama. Okay. So, shall I move to the next slide then? You have to remember the olfactory pathway. You have to go. Now, next one is the applied anatomy. You know anosmia, the loss of the uh, sense of the smell. Next, the cause may be a common cold. It may be a fracture that is affecting the anterior cranial fossa, which will be involving the uh, sorry, creviform uh, plate. Next, we may have the tumor in the cerebrum. Uh, our clinical test coronary, you ask the patient to smell common order like peppermint, garlic, and the globe. You general low, you so I'll skip this. Next one is the optic knob. So the optic knob is the second cranial knob. It is a sensory one or the motor one. Sensory. Sensory. Now, can you recall the functional component of the optic nerve? Optic nerve is mainly related with the visor, uh, special one, special sensation. That means the functional component Q is go. Special somatic Good. It is having the afferent. It is a sensory one. It is carrying the special sensation. So from the body, so special somatic afferent. That is the uh, functional component of optic nerve. Now, the origin is, just see over here, these are the layer of the retina. So over here, we have the rod and cone. This is the bipolar cell layer. This one is the ganglionic cell layer. Okay. Now, from the axon, from the axon, uh, the axon of the ganglionic cell of the retina will form the optic nerve. And this optic nerve will exit out from the eyeball. It will enter into the cranial cavity through the optic foramen. You see, it is initially present in the uh, orbit. From the orbit, it will enter into the middle cranial fossa through the optic foramen. Optic foramen, the thickest of number say bone man. Now, finally, it will end by forming uh, optic chiasma. This is the optic knob. Now, there is one peculiarity of the optic knob. The optic knob is not the cranial knob. It, uh, sorry, it is not a peripheral knob, but it is the prolongation of the white matter. Also, it is a part of the central nervous system. peripheral knob mainly. Next one is, uh, it, as it is not the peripheral knob, the myelination of the optic knob is mainly done by the oligodendrocytes. It is covered by the three meninges because it is a part of the central nervous system. So brain majatine meninges or the meninges lini, these are covered by the three different three meninges. So as it is covered by the three meninges, you also have the subarachnoid space over here, space pani also, and it is likely to undergo the atrophy in a prolonged increase of the cerebrospinal fluid pressure. So whenever you have the increased CSF or increased CS, uh, increased cranial pressure, then it may go it may atrophy. 
Next peculiarity is it is devoid of the Neury lemma. That's why if it is damaged once, then it is very difficult to reason it. It cannot be reasoned. Next is a uh, visual pathway. So the visual pathway, the first we have got the retina, retina but we have the optic nerve, then we have the optic chiasma, then we have the optic tract. The optic tract over here, we have the lateral genuclead body, the lateral genuclead nucleus of the thalamus. Now from there, one radiation will go outward and posteriorly, that is known as the optic radiation, and finally end into the primary visual area, area number 17, present in the occipital lobe. So this is the visual pathway. And you have to remember this one. You visual pathway, Buzio? Buzio, ma'am. Okay, same A. Optic nerve, chiasma, optic tract, lateral genuclead body, optic radiation, and area number 17, primary visual area. Now, next, the visual pathway. These are the component of the visual pathway. You have to know about the retina. Retina, we have the various different types of cells. The rod is there, cone is there, bipolar cell is there, ganglionic cell is there, and the optic nerve is mainly formed by the axon of the ganglionic cell. Now we have the optic nerve, optic chiasma, optic uh, tract, lateral geniculate body, optic radiation, and the visual area. So these are the component of the visual pathway. So in the visual pathway, we mainly have the three different sets of the neuron. So the one set of the first set of the neuron is formed by the, by the bipolar cells. So this is the bipolar cells which will form the first order or neuron. This will re receive the impulse from the rod and cone, and this will synapse those impulses with the, or this will transmit those impulses to the ganglionic cell. Next is the second order neuron, which is formed by the ganglionic cell. And this ganglionic cell, the axon of the ganglionic cell will form the optic nerve. Now, our optic nerve plus the optic chiasma, then optic tract. Then the third order neuron will be formed by lateral geniculate body or the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus will form the third order neuron. Now next, the more another important thing you have to know about the visual reflex, there are the two different types of reflex. One is the pupillary light reflex. Next one is known as the accommodation reflex. download Okay, so the pupillary light reflex one. Do you have any idea about the pupillary light reflex? Physiology cover boy, the pupillary light reflex. Practical no boy. Practical no boy. So the pupillary light reflex, you know, uh, when the light falls into the eye, then the uh, pupil of that eye or the pupil will get constriction. So the constriction of the pupil when the light falls into your eye that is known as the pupillary light reflex. Now the pupillary light reflex one, you, see about the, you know about the direct and the consensual thasola, you know this one. What do you mean by the direct and what do you mean by the consensual light reflex? Constriction of uh, pupil in the eye in which light is exposed in the body direct. You time a light exposed to the orco pupil can constitution. That is known as consensual. Now, can you answer me why the consensual light reflex is there? Can you give the reason behind the consensual light reflex? Uh, first order neurons, the p tectal nucleus, terminate on the camera. Second order neuron both are uh, first and order one neuron. First order to win on in the first order. Ka. First order number no. P tectal nucleus uh, has got the bilateral connection with the Edinger Westphal nucleus. I know. Okay. You know about the direct and consensual, eh? So the direct means in which the light fall, if the uh, pupil of that particular eye will get con uh, constrict, that is known as the direct. But when you uh, 
when you expose the light into in one eye and when you see the pupil of the opposite eye then the pupil of the opposite eye will get constrict that is known as the conscientious light reflex now see why this pupillary light reflex is happening uh, what is the path for the direct and the conscientious now i'll just uh, trace those pathway just see over here now from the retina the uh, there will be the optic nerve optic nerve then optic chiasma then optic uh, tract so uh, the information will pass from the retina into the optic nerve then into the optic chiasma then into the optic tract now this from the optic tract okay i'm ready to uh, vision my visual path we are getting the information is finally terminate in not finally it will terminate the axon this one will terminate into the lateral geniculate body but in the pupillary light reflex the information from the optic uh, tract so from the optic tract over here this will terminate into the pretectal nucleus in the midbrain now from there it will terminate another another order of neuron will terminate into the edinger westphal nucleus okay tin le first order bane thik hai yani so or or edinger westphal nucleus now from here the information will be carried by through the oculomotor nerve into the ciliary ganglia and from here the short ciliary nerve will carry the information that will finally innervate the sphincter pupillae and this is going to constrict the pupil will have the constriction of the pupil finally so this is the overall pathway of the pupillary light reflex that means when the light is fall on this eye then the information is carried by the retina from the retina through the optic nerve optic chiasma optic tract into the pretectal nucleus into edinger westphal nucleus oculomotor nerve ciliary ganglia short ciliary nerve and sphincter pupillae in this way there is the connection this is the uh, flow or the pathway of the direct consensual uh, di sorry direct uh, reflex pupillary reflex is it clear this one buzu you hello no, now next next what will happen in the consensual ab consensual mein kya hun so bane so if you expose a light to this eye then the information will be carried from the retina into the optic nerve optic chiasma optic tract then into the pretectal nucleus now can you see the bilateral connection of the uh, left pretectal nucleus into the edinger westphal nucleus can you see the bilateral connection so due to this bilateral connection the information will be carried to the another edinger edinger westphal nucleus then carried by the left so it carried by the right oculomotor nerve into the ciliary ganglia optic and then short ciliary nerve with the sphincter pupillae of the right eye then we'll have the constriction of the pupil in the right side also so this is mainly due to the bilateral connection of the pretectal nucleus with the edinger westphal nucleus this is the pupillary light reflex consensual you buzz you Yeah, okay now i'll move to the accommodation reflex now accommodation reflex means the adjustment of the optical apparatus for a near vision and for that purpose we require the three different axon one the eye has to be converse and for the conversion of the eye uh, the muscles mainly the medial rectus muscle has to contract next one the pupil has to constrict so that more light will not be allowed to our eye and next is the thickening of lens for the accommodation or in order to change the refractive index the lens has to be thickened so all those uh, action has to be occur for the accommodation reflex ab you sab pe action karna ko laki this is the pathway now i'll tell you one now in this diagram this part the left one is showing the pupillary reflex and the right one is showing the accommodation reflex so first we'll just focus on the accommodation reflex now from here the retina for the near vision so over here from the, the information from the retina will pass to the optic nerve then optic chiasma then optic tract then lateral geniculate body then optic radiation or the visual area now from the visual area from the visual area the information will be transmit to the oculomotor nucleus oculomotor nucleus both motor and the edinger westphal nucleus both now from there the information will pass through the oculomotor nerve 
into the ciliary ganglia, short ciliary nerve, would they, it will innervate the sphincter pupillae. Now, if the sphincter pupillae will be innervated, it will cause the constriction. Now, next muscle, it will also activate the ciliary muscle. So, this, what is the function of the ciliary muscle? The ciliary muscle contract the suspensory ligament of the lens will get loose. As a result, the lens will get thickened. So, the thickening of the lens is mainly caused by the contraction of the ciliary muscle. So, the two action is over. One is the constriction of the pupil and the thickening of the lens has been over. Now, next one is the uh, uh, deviation, medial deviation of the eye. So, medial deviation of the eye. Can you see the medial rectus muscle? This is the medial rectus muscle. The medial rectus muscle has to be innervated, and this is innervated by the oculomotor nerve. Oculomotor nerve is innervating the medial rectus uh, muscle. So, the same nerve is innervating the medial rectus muscle. Now, this will cause the medial deviation of the eye. Now, altogether, all this, all this thing will happen and the accommodation will occur. Accommodation for near vision. So, this is the accommodation reflex. Okay. Now, if you compare the two different things, if you compare the pupillary light reflex and the accommodation reflex, you can see in the pupillary light reflex, the pretectal nucleus is involved. But in the accommodation reflex, mainly the uh, motor nucleus of the oculomotor and the edinger westphal nucleus of the oculomotor is involved, not the pretectal involved. Hey, this thing, you could have yadgar. Is it clear? Accommodation reflex? Bujiyo? Okay. Now, next thing, what you have to know, you know, you have to know is ARP and PRA. So, I have given here in a shortcut, short form, my era, accommodation reflex is present, pupillary reflex in absent. So, in the case, in uh, in case of the damage of the pretectal nucleus. The light reflex is disappear because the pretectal nucleus is damaged. Pretectal nucleus damaged by but see when you expose the light to one uh, light to any eye, then the pupil will not get constrict because the pretectal nucleus is damaged. So pupillary light reflex is absent, but accommodation reflex is present. Accommodation reflex is present. Uh, the eye or the pupil will get constrict for uh, during the accommodation. So the pupil constriction during accommodation is present, but pupillary right reflex is absent. Whenever you will have the damage of the pretectal nucleus, you busy you want to go. Hello. Busy man. Okay. Now the lesion of the visual pathway. So complete blindness of one eye. So you, you can see over here. Eh? So you know, when you have a lesion in this part in number one, you'll have the complete blindness of the right eye because the right uh, optic nerve is damaged. Now, whenever you will be having a damage in this part, then you'll be having the right nasal hemianopia. That's a right nasal hemianopia. Right eye ko nasal side ko vision mata loss on so. Next one, whenever you will be having a lesion in optic chiasma, then we will be having a bitemporal heteronymous hemianopia. That means uh, the temporal side of both eye, so the left mapping temporal, the right mapping temporal, that is known as bitemporal heteronymous hemianopia will happen. Now, whenever you have the uh, this one, the four one, damage in this part, that will result to the homonymous hemianopia. That means both the eye go same side, the right half, uh, sorry, left half of both eye. Is mapani left part koyo? Is mapani left part? That is known as homonymous hemianopia. Now the fifth is also homonymous hemianopia, and the sixth one, the last one, this is also homonymous hemianopia. So these are the uh, lesion okay. in optic nerve, optic nerve in optic pathway, visual pathway. So this is all about today's class. We have finished the optic nerve of olfactory nerve and the optic nerve. And the next uh, class we'll be reading the uh, three, four, five, six cranial nerve up to. So if you have any question, then you can ask me. Kiso Sudnuporni.
हेलो मैम तो एकोमोडेशन रिफ्लेक्स था नहीं तेरे लिए पिट गोर्डी नो ना इट्स इम्पोर्टेंट यो अकोमोडेशन रिफ्लेक्स सो अकोमोडेशन रिफ्लेक्स होने को लगी द थ्री एक्शन हैज़ टू बॉक्सर ए वन इज convergence of the eye so the eye has to move or the people has to move towards the medial side in convergence of the eye so your medial deep move now next one is the constriction of the pupil is so constriction of the pupil you know because we are focusing for the near vision and the constriction of the pupil will not allow the more light to pass next one is the thickening of the lens so thickening of the lens in order to change the refractive index so all those three thing has to be अगर अब ये तीन तीन तरह चीज़ होने को लगी जैसे कंस्ट्रक्शन होने को लगी विच न्यूक्लियस इज़ इन्वॉल्व एरिंजर वेस्ट पाल न्यूक्लियस इज़ इन्वॉल्व फॉर द कंस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ़ पीपल यू नो सो एरिंजर वेस्ट पाल न्यूक्लियस इज़ द वन ऑफ़ द न्यूक्लियस ऑफ़ द ऑक्टल मोटर नॉर्थ सो आई जस्ट ट्रेस � and visual area. So this is the visual pathway. Visual pathway is the same way. Now from here, from here, our superior longitudinal fasciculus, it will enter, it will enter into the accumulator, accumulator nerve complex or the accumulator nuclear complex. So accumulator nuclear complex, it consists of the various nuclei of the accumulator. It's my Edinger was pal nucleus, motor nucleus of accumulator. Our Edinger was pal nucleus, like it was Edinger was pal nucleus, mainly it is innervating the sphincter pupillae and the uh, ciliary muscle. So Edinger was pal nucleus, but from here, it will pass through the occlumator nerve, ciliary ganglia, short ciliary nerve, it will innervate the sphincter pupillae and the ciliary muscle. So when it will innervate the sphincter pupillae, then the sphincter pupillae uh, contract the, uh, there will be the constriction of the pupil. Now next one is ciliary muscle. Ciliary muscle contract by suspensory ligament of the lens will get loose. As a result, this lens will get thick. So the thickening of the lens and the spring, uh, constriction of the pupil will occur. Now next one, the last action is remaining. That is the convergence of the eye. Our convergence of eye, the muscle that is known as medial rectus, that is the muscle of the eye has to innervate. And this is inner, also innervated by the optometer nerve. So in the motor nuclei, can you see this one motor? In the motor nuclei of the, uh, motor nuclei of the optometer nerve will get activated. Then it will innervate the medial rectus muscle. It will pull the eye towards the middle side or eyeball towards the middle side. So in this way, overall accommodation will occur. Is it clear? You busy over? You to pull the eye. Yes. Only guard. Yes. Optic orbit. One. The body. Bakus. I know. You will be having class separate class for orbit. Orbit one and two. One. So this my fear. You repeat also. Hey, innervation of the muscles of eye. No, and this was our Edinger was pal nucleus. You want to go cure your ciliary ganglia. You'll be reading those things in detail in orbit. I only eat in me, but yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. All cases on the morning. Okay, then I'll end the class. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am.